Hey, what's up, everyone? It's uh, Sync, bringing you guys a solo raids guide. Um, I'm bringing you guys this today because I've been asked pretty often to make a solo raids guide. Um, almost told that, you know, other guides are a little outdated, so I'm here to bring you guys a quote-unquote updated one. Hopefully the meta doesn't change too much in the future. Um, this might be the only guide I ever make. I uh, don't really have plans to make too many videos in the future, but who knows? This is probably going to be a long one. Um, I do have other videos uploaded on my channel, but those are all Call of Duty related. As some of you know, I used to do Call of Duty before I started doing RuneScape. But I'm keeping them up for basically the memories. Um, I'll be referencing other guides during this video as well. I highly recommend learning raids in teams before solo raids. But if you guys kind of want to get into the action and learn solo raids immediately, then hopefully this guide will help you out. Um, I will have links in this description for uh, example raids. I might do raids in pub gear, uh, welfare gear, max gear, gear with no armor, um, and I'll be referencing links to Wooks' solo guide, Though Boys raids team guide, and Stay West's four to one guide. Um, all of them will be referenced at some point in the video. Um, other than that, let's get into it. The skill requirements for solo raids uh, are a bit different from team raids, as you'll see in just a moment. Um, technically, you can go into raids as a level 3, but obviously, you know, that's not recommended if you're doing solo raids. Um, what I personally recommend is base 90 stats. It's really nice to have, uh, especially for, you know, your accuracy, your damage. It helps out a ton, plus whatever armor you are. Uh, you can go on as a 1 defense pure if you wish, but I personally don't recommend that. It's really up to you. Uh, something else would be at least 115 combat. Uh, the way raids work in any team size is the lower combat level you have, the less the points actually scale. So what people found out is that 115 is a really good number where the raids points is actually decent. And it's pretty much the average of the entire team. But because you're doing solo raids, the only average is yourself. Uh, obviously, the higher combat level you have, the more points you're potentially going to get. But 115 is kind of like, you know, the bare minimum you want. Um, having base 90 stats is nice. I guess prayer, you don't necessarily need it. Um, be, I would highly recommend getting piety at 70 prayer. So at least 70 prayer. Eventually, you'll unlock things like rigor and augury at 77. So um, that might be nice. Um, for herblore, I would recommend getting 90. That way you can make yourselves the best overloads in raids, which is uh, the best possible ones. Um, but you can do it at 78. I say this because you can make your best revitalization potions, Xerix aids, and prayer enhances, but you can potentially get overload drops from the raid itself. Uh, things that drop overloads are Tekton, Mutterdial, and Vanguards. Those are the three uh, bosses that can actually drop overloads. Vanguards is a bit random, so if you're going to go in with 78 Herblore, you're kind of stuck between you have to get a raid with Tekton, uh, Vanguards, or Mutterdal. Um, construction, you want at least 30 construction. This way you can make the small chest in raids. The higher chests don't really matter in solo raids, but uh, you know if you want more points to build the chest, then go for the 90 chest. Um, but 30 chests is basically what you need. For farming, you need at least 55 farming. And the reason for this is you need to be able to farm Noxifers. I highly recommend it. 55 farming is really not that high, but obviously the higher farming level you have, the better yield that you get. So at least 55 farming. Mining level doesn't matter too much, but the higher mine level you have, if you have 61, you can kill with the Dragon Pickaxe. For the Room of Guardians, uh, the higher pickaxe you use, the more damage you put, of course, because you're using a Dragon Pickaxe. The higher mining level you have, the higher max hit you actually get. So for example, in max combat at 99, I could be hitting 56s, but at 61 mining, I might be hitting 50s. Um, so the higher mining level, the better, but 61 is recommended. Uh, wood cutting doesn't matter uh, really much. Uh, when you're cutting Mutterdow's trees, it is dependent on your wood cutting level, but it's not the most important thing in the world because I'm pretty sure you can cut it at level one and use a bronze ax. Uh, everything is scaled to yourself in uh, solo raid. Fishing and hunting are two things you do, do not need when you're doing solo raids. There's never a time where you need to fish or hunt, so you can completely ignore those. For agility and thieving, 
if you're doing the tightrope room you will always be able to do it if you're doing thieving room you will always be able to do it uh, jagex will never give you a raid where you can't cross the tightrope that would be a little weird uh, or you can't thieve from the chest in a solo raid. It would literally prevent you from doing the raid. So um, the only thing would be higher thieving uh, because, you know, your rate of success of thieving the chest at the thieving room would be uh, a lot better. Uh, agility higher as well because your run energy would uh, restore a little bit faster. Although you're bringing in stamina, it might be nice. But like I said, for agility and thieving, you will always be able to do the tyro room and the thieving room regardless. Something I forgot to mention in the next upcoming clips is the use of a rune pouch. I personally don't use it simply because there's a way to dodge flame walls uh, during a solo ohm fight. Um, but for people learning, I would highly recommend bringing this in. You need a water, air, and mind rune stack to be put into your rune pouch and make sure you're on standard spellbook. Uh, the reason you use water strike is because if you try to use the highest level water spell and try to free yourself from ohm's flame attack, uh, there's a chance you might be brewed down and you won't be able to cast it at level 85. So that is why you bring the lowest water spell possible. This uh, rune pouch will not be included in the next upcoming screenshots. So if you need to remove a brew or possibly something that isn't as important to bring in gear wise, make sure to do so. Also, I may as well add, the purple sweets is completely optional. I personally bring it in because I do not need any money, so any money loss is nothing to me. Uh, as well as it could increase my chances of survival in some sense. So anything that'll increase my chance of getting the omelet faster is what I'll be bringing in. So now we're actually going to go through all the different type of setups for solar raids. Uh, this setup is mainly for people that do not own a leap void or even wish to get regular void. Uh, I would highly recommend getting a dragon warhammer, but if you really can't, the BGS is your next best option. Uh, this is pretty bad gear. Samurai can house is what you want to camp. You may be a glory if you really can afford a fury, but this is the worst possible gear I'd probably go into raids with that isn't void. This is the next set of gear for solo raids. This is the elite void setup, or even regular void for that matter. Because you're using void this time, you have less switches, which is a lot easier to switch with, and you have more brews. I highly recommend going with this if you don't have the amount of money. And uh, it's probably the cheapest gear you could go when uh, using Elite Void or even regular Void. So this next setup is a pretty big jump in gear, uh, but I will make sure to explain everything thoroughly. The Zenite Jewelry, which is the Amulet of Torture and the Necklace of Anguish, are very important to have. I would highly recommend getting those before any of your boot switches. If you can afford Primordial Boots and Pegasian Boots, they're really nice, but if you can only afford one, camp the Primordial Boots over the Pegasian Boots. The Dragon Hunter Crossbow is something that appears here as well. If you're using Dragon Ruby Bolts, they are very nice and even better than the Blowpipe on Ohm's head. At around 20%, that is when you will switch to your Blowpipe. The Dragon Warhammer is very important. If you can get only one thing from this setup, I would highly recommend getting the Dragon Warhammer over anything else. Um, the Elder Maul is now here. It is really nice for Tekton because it is a crush weapon as well as Ohm's hands for doing the 1-0 method, which I will explain later. If you're going to be doing the 1-0 method and you can't afford an Elder Maul, get a God Sword. You know, it's kind of depressing when you're trying to make a Solar Raids guide and someone makes fun of you for not having the pet. But uh, anyways, this next setup is pretty similar to the last setup. Uh, it's for people that feel like they need the accuracy of Dragonite, for example, and uh, they want the extra damage of the Tormented Bracelet and accuracy of full Arams. Uh, pretty straight to the point, um, the fighter torso isn't too important at this point, I guess. It has some nice strength bonus like the BCP, but you can just wear the dragon eye top if you feel like you need more food. So this setup is pretty much as close as you can get to maxed gear. Um, this is kind of what I expect most people to be using. Um, some things have changed in this setup. We switched out the void for bandas, armor, and ancestral. Uh, there are no more Pegasian Boots, mainly because with full Armadil, you have some really nice accuracy, and at that point, Pegasian Boots aren't really that worth it, so we only kept the Primordial Boots. The reason we can't ban us Chestplate is because the Banos Chestplate has very nice range defense compared to the Tacits, and you also get the Strength Bonus from it as well. We have banked the Magic uh, Imbued Cape, because having that with this setup will not actually give you a maxed hit. So having this uh, lowers the amount of switches you get for more food, and you get a max hit with it as well. 
So this is the absolute maxed setup you could possibly have. Quite a few things have changed and I will run down each and every change to the best of my abilities. Uh, if you do not have a Scythe of Vater, you will be banking that for an extra brew. If you do not have the Twisted Bow, you will be banking that for the Dragon Hunter Crossbow and replacing your Dragon Arrows with Dragon Ruby Bolts. Uh, the Rapier is better than the Hasta and the Kraken Tentacle Whip for two different reasons. One, uh, it has an extra max hit if you use it on the aggressive attack style and it acts as a stab weapon over the whip. We have replaced the Dragon Fender with the Avernic Defender. Our mage gear has changed quite a bit as well. With the Sanguine SD Staff, you actually get another max hit if you actually bring the Imbued Zamrock Cape. So instead of a 4-way switch, you'll be having a 5-way switch. Um, we have also banked one less stamina because I feel like if you're using this gear, you probably have a general idea of how to do solar raids, but if you need another stamina, then switch out an extra brew for that. To sum all of that up, every gear setup that I'm displaying to you guys is simply an outline. You don't have to bring exactly what I bring or what I show to you guys. For example, you know, more staminas might be extremely helpful for people learning. So for those of you that have absolute maxed gear but have never done a solo raid in your life, you might want to tone down. You know, maybe bring just a max cape and bank all of your capes, slash camping the range cape. Uh, don't bring in a scythe of a turn, you know, etc. Maybe have people scout for you and you don't have to bring in a bronze axe or elder maul. Basically, what you bring is what you bring. You need to be able to be comfortable with your supplies going into the raid. And you don't have to copy, you know, the best setup in the world or my setup exactly. Just go with what you're comfortable with and over time try to alter your setup to appease your fitting. Also, shout out to this guy in the chat. Now to go over which items you can bank. Maybe you have an alt or friends that will hold a raid for you when it's scouted or maybe you're a streamer and you have a raid scouted and you can have people hold it for you. There are certain raids where you don't need certain items, you can make them. Of course pay attention to what you're using at Ulm. So if you're using certain methods like 3 to 1 you obviously need a whip slash rapier or the 1 to 0 method you need the elder maul. But scratching all of that, let's pay attention to this theoretical layout. Shaman, Skeletals, Guardians, Rogue Crabs. This means we'll need a sand few, and we could bring in a salve EI if we wanted to, as well as a pickaxe. However, we can bank things like the bronze axe because we don't have mudder doll. We can bank the lock pick because no thieving. Uh, we can theoretically bank the Zamorak and Hasta because we don't have Tekdon or Vasa. And if you're using the rapier at Ulm, you can also bank the Elder Maul. So basically what I'm saying is figure out what you have in the raid and always double check what items you need. And if you 100% do not need a certain item, you can bank it for more food and continue on with your raid. Now, some of you have already noticed that I bring in purple sweets personally. And I get this question a lot, what do they do? They heal a random number between 1 and 3 towards your hit points and they guarantee 10% run energy. So it's kind of like having an unlimited stamina. I personally bring it in because I don't care about wasting too much money. Um, it is not very efficient if you want to make money at raids, but for those that want to learn and you have some extra money to blow, you can bring in a stack of purple sweets to save yourself. They can also be used to tick eight against certain NPCs within the raid as well. So before I start off with the actual raids, I want to get into how to scout a solo raid. Uh, and I want to make this very clear. This is a disclaimer. Um, if you're going to use a third-party client, use it at your own risk. I know that there are clients out there like RuneLight, OSBuddy, and Conduit that are very trustworthy. But like I said, you can never be 100% sure. So use them at your own risk. I personally use RuneLight, but uh, you can use whatever you wish. Um, but basically, on a client like RuneLight, you either have a raid scouter that actually tells you the raid or you can check yourself by showing the instanced map. Now you might be asking, what does the instance map do? Well, it shows the first floor and the second floor of the raid if you don't have the scouter that's located right here. Um, manually doing this, you can tell which raid you are going to get by the raid rotations. The puzzles are kind of random. You'll usually get two puzzles per raid, um, but what's, what is very static is the combat rooms. So I'm going to pull up an image here, and these are the rotations. Um, there are two different rotations. They can go clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, so you just got to figure out which rooms come 
in which order. So for an example, this is a perfect way to show an example. This is crabs. You can't tell which puzzles are going to be in order because they're not static. But I can see here that this is the shaman room. And on the second floor, I have guardians and mudadal. So if we hold up the rotations list, you can see that the only possible outcome would be the second rotation on the right. And it would be shamans, vespula, guardians, mudadal. Uh, so to double check, you can obviously see that, you know, it'd be shamans, best people are somewhere hidden in this area. Then on the third, second floor, it would be uh, the guardians and Modadal. Uh Scouting raids can be a bit hectic. Uh, having plugins like this from Moonlight is very helpful because it actually tells you what you're getting. The second puzzle is unknown, as you can see, because you can't check the second puzzle because, like I said, they're not static. But that's basically the gist of how to scout solar raids. There are some raids where you can actually start and essentially check the raid before you leave. Uh, for those of you that are Iron Man or even people that don't have alts to hold raids, you're probably going to have to go in with everything on you. Your pickaxe, your bronze axe, your elder maul, etc. Um, so there are raids where you can actually start and go far enough inside so you don't lose too much time, but you can check what you have. So for example, on this list, you see that, um, obviously we don't want to do this raid already because thieving, but let's say this puzzle is tightrope, right? It could be a potentially good raid if this puzzle is crabs. So what we can do is we can check if we can check it. Now, I know immediately that you can from this layout. Um, if you start the raid and go far enough in, you can then check yourself whether the raid is worth doing or not and checking if the uh, puzzle is what you want uh, in this layout you can actually go far enough here so that you can actually load up the lines and as you can see i can tell that it's crabs and if this was a tightrope raid it would be worth doing now to discuss what is a good raid now a good raid is kind of relative to who you're talking to for example our friend lake would consider shaman skeletal guardians rope crabs as an amazing raid because it's really good points and it's extremely fast the faster raids you get, the better in terms of getting to Ulm and finishing the raid for better points per hour. However, you know, some people might find shamans difficult or tightrope or crabs too difficult and thieving might be nice for them or, or ice demon. So I'll just quickly run down each and every room. The three best rooms in terms of points is skeleton mystics, lizardmen, shamans, and tightrope. So if you're just going to go for points, make sure you have those three rooms. If you can even get two out of three of those rooms, that is really good still. You know, but if you have only one of them and you're trying to go for points, you know, it's not really the best idea. But, uh, you know, if you can get at least two out of three of those rooms, it is extremely ideal. Now, in terms of going for fast raids, you want to get, you know, the easy rooms. Skeleton Mystics, Guardians, uh, Shamans, uh, Crystal Crabs, and Tightrope. Uh, those rooms are extremely fast, and because you normally get two puzzles in every raid, you ideally want Crystal Crabs and Tightrope. But, you know, in terms of trying to get the raid done and you're having troubles with Crystal Crabs or Tightrope, then you could settle for Thieving, for example. But in terms of the speed, Crystal Crabs and Tightrope are the two puzzles you want to shoot for and rooms like Guardians, Skeletals, and Shamans are extremely fast. Now, in terms of all of the bosses, Mudadal and Boss and Mysterio are relatively easy bosses compared to the other ones. So if you're looking for easy bosses to do, you want to do either Skeletal Mystics, Shamans, Guardians, Mudadal, or Vasa. And the puzzles that you would want is Crystal Crabs and a Tightrope. Now, we have to go over the other rooms. Uh, Tekton, Vanguards, and Vespula can be a bit difficult. You know, Tekton can be extremely difficult if you don't have the timing practice. Uh, Vanguards can be a bit hectic if you're standing in the middle taking damage from everything. And with Vespula, you have to do the redemption method to do it, you know, efficiently and worth it. Uh, I kind of put it in order in terms of, you know, how much trouble people normally have with each boss. So, uh, you know, you might want to take more time to learn Vespula before you start doing Vespula in your solar raids. As I said before, Thieving and an Ice Demon are really slow rooms. They are extremely easy, but if you want to do them just to try and get through your first solar raid, then go for it. As I stated previously, it is recommended to have 90 Herb Lore. Because with 90 Herb Lore, you can make the best Overload, Overload Plus. However, if you do not have 90 Herb Lore, 
you basically have to tie yourself to certain raids that guarantee you an overload drop. Now, these are the rooms on the board that drop supplies. Tekton will guarantee you two overloads. Mudderdile will guarantee you two overloads. However, Vanguards don't. Vanguards has a random chance. Because there's three Vanguards, you have a chance to get an overload from each of them. However, some raids you might get only one, two, maybe even three, and some raids you won't get any. So if you're planning to go in without 90 herb lore and you only have Vanguards, which is the only overload chance room, uh, it's a gamble and I wouldn't recommend it. If you have Vespula and Basa, if you wish to do Vespula, as I said, it might be a little difficult, but it does drop you some nice supplies, as well as Basa and Asteria. As you can see from this raid, this is a very good raid to do. I have Mystics, Guardians, Tightrope, Vasa, and Crabs. Mystics and Tightrope being extremely good points, and Guardians, Vasa, Crabs being very fast rooms, so I can get to Ohm faster and complete the raid faster for better points per hour. Now, I'm sure you guys have encountered this really annoying glitch before, where you're trying to scout a raid and create a party, but that a little annoying message comes up. When you scout your raid, all you have to do is start it up and leave right after. Now, what people normally do is they'll scout the raid, see it's not worth doing, and immediately leave like this. But what you're supposed to do is start the raid and press 1, so that's a double 1. 1, climb the steps, 1, and when you go back to the board, it will never have that annoying message ever again. The next puzzle we'll be looking at is Ice Demon. There are three different layouts to Ice Demon, but they're all similar so I don't have to go through each and every one. The Ice Demon is quite a decent amount of points, but also takes quite some time as well. To start off the fight, you'll realize that it's stuck in an ice storm and you can't actually attack it, but you notice that there are four braziers and one Ice Fiend. There's a myth going around that lighting the brazier with an Ice Fiend on it will actually kill it off faster and the light will go out, and that's not what you want. So you might as well light the braziers without an ice fiend on it. Before starting off this room, you might want to drop all of your supplies or anything that's invaluable to you so you can kill some scavengers. As you can see, I've already built a chest and gotten the secondaries that I need. Once that's finished, you want to pick up all of your potions and bake anything that you don't need. Once you've deposited everything, you can go and grab a bronze axe and a tinderbox spawn somewhere inside of the room. The spawns are always in each and every layout of Ice Demon, so you don't have to worry about bringing them in or killing a scavenger for them. Once you've got your Bronze Axe and Tinderbox, you can start cutting these trees for kindling. The amount of kindling you need is two inventories of 24, so 48 kindling total. Each inventory of 24 goes into a brazier, so all you need to light is two empty braziers. You'll need two inventories of 24, but if you want to be lazy, you can just get two full inventories. After you've banked a full inventory or another, you can go ahead and light two braziers. As I said before, you might want to avoid lighting the brazier with an ice fiend on it. After you've lit one, go back to the chest, get yourself another full inventory, and light another brazier. As you can see, over time, Ice Demon's health will go down, and that shows how much longer it takes for it to thaw out of the ice storm. In the meantime, you can bank all your stuff, and get anything back that you need. Right now all you ever really need is your range gear and your melee gear. Before the fight begins, you might want to pot up, drink your enhance, super combat or ranging potion, and make sure you have your dragon warhammer out, or BGS. I would highly recommend going on pound, or the accurate option as it gives you a bit more accuracy. Use Piety, Protect Range, and start Dragon Warm specking it, or BGS specking it, while dodging these rocks. If you're lucky enough, unlike me, you'll actually land some specs. The recommended weapon of choice is either the Twisted Bow or the Blowpipe. Crossbow is not recommended. All you have to do is dodge these rocks, and move every two squares. It's pretty simple to do, and Ice Demon becomes a very easy boss to do.
the next puzzle room is the thieving room the thieving room is the worst points in terms of time and points per hour but it's a very easy room normally you want to avoid this when doing solos but if you're looking for an easy out then feel free to do it uh there are various amounts of chests uh some chests are poison and other chests have cavern grubs the layouts are not that important however as you can see this chest is poison in this layout um for the rest of this raid this chest will always be poison if i open it again however if i get this layout again in another raid this chest might not be poison again it's not static but it'll stay poison for the rest of the raid you want to get 30 cavern grubs exactly to fill off the uh, trough over here however if you feed it too early the scavenger can actually heal over time so what you would normally want to do is get about 30 exactly whether it's dropping them or putting it in your private chest and feeding the scavenger all at once when doing the thieving room it's nice to find a set of four chests you can thieve from so that you can constantly go around in a cycle as long as they're close to each other you'll normally not lose too much time or if any time at all and it's really nice to do sometimes if the thieving room is the first room or if you wish to bring in a lock pick you can the lock pick helps speed up your thieving by a few ticks it's not that helpful but if you're very confident with the amount of supplies you're taking in you might want to bring in a lock pick and then just drop it once the room is completed in every thieving layout there is only one random chest with bats in it when finding the bats you get extra points to your total as well as you can get points for eating them if you have hp to heal there is a certain algorithm to finding the bats, but it's not worth it going over it. Looking for the bats really isn't that worth it. However, you know, if you come across it, you can get some extra points and some extra food if you might need it. The chest will remain permanently open for the rest of the raid, so you can't just constantly thieve it for more bats. The orb that comes out of this glowing carving will correspond to what attack style you attack the crab with. As you can see, there are four different colors. There is a black crystal, there's a yellow crystal, a purple crystal, and a blue cyan crystal. The way to do this room is basically changing the color depending on which crystal you're bouncing it into. So white corresponds to black, blue corresponds to yellow, green corresponds to purple, and red corresponds to cyan. Before you start this room, you have to make sure you have a crush weapon that can actually smash these crabs. Weapons that work are the Dragon Warhammer, the Elder Maul, and just a regular hammer you can buy from your general store. With the weapons, you have to make sure they're equipped before you can actually smash. To change the color of the orb, you have to bounce it off the uh, crystal crab. To turn it red, you have to melee it. To turn it green, you have to range it. And to turn it blue, you have to mage it. First, you gotta make sure you have this crystal crab against the wall and smash one of them. Now, here's where it gets interesting. The orb can actually bounce off of certain walls. So what you can actually do is, you can take advantage of it. And you can actually move over here, have it line up, and the orb can bounce over here, off the wall, back onto the crab, and back into the blue crystal if you wish. As you see here. Another way of doing crabs is putting this all the way against the wall, Making sure this is two spaces away so the orb has time to bounce, smashing this as well. Now you have to get a third crystal crab, pull it over here, and, and don't do that, of course. Once the orb comes out, it'll actually bounce off these three crabs, and you can get all of the crystals this way. Doing it this way is a very easy way of doing things, but it isn't the fastest way. It's simple for people that just want to get this room over with. As you can just do every single crystal just by moving in a straight line. You can get this crystal, you can move up, get this next crystal, move up one, get the purple crystal, and move all the way down and get the yellow crystal.
The black crystal is already finished, but it's pretty self-explanatory. The first thing to go over in this room is your weapon of choice. The Twisted Bow is best in slot for the mages, however the Blowpipe is actually better than the T-Bow for the rangers in terms of DPS. If you do not own a Twisted Bow, then you'll be using the Blowpipe across all of your kills. This next clip is for those with a Twisted Bow. When using the T-Bow on the mages, you'll notice very quickly that their attack speed is faster than the T-Bow. So what you can do is kite around their maxed range and kind of get a one-to-one -one ratio. After attacking, just walk out of its attack range and attack again and repeat the cycle. So then it's just a one-to-one -one ratio. There are two different ways of taking less damage at tightrope rangers. The first method, you constantly flick on your bandos chestplate or even full bandos to take less damage on the right tick. The other one is to constantly kite around the shadow route. That method saves you a lot of food, but the second method is probably nicer as well. It's a lot easier to put your weapon of choice under the BCP so that you can just quickly flick. And of course, if you're using the crossbow, the same applies. Traditionally, when doing this room, you want to take them all out and take a bit of damage to speed everything up. However, sometimes when you're at the end of the raid and you're about to prep and you have tightrope, you might not have enough supplies. So there's a way to take absolutely no damage in this room. However, it takes more time. So of course, you're kind of trading using no food at all, you know, before you prep, uh, but it's taking a bit longer. This method either requires a T-bow or a crossbow. I'm not sure if you have to be on long range for the crossbow, but I think you can do it on rapid as well. This method is simple. You are basically trading time for food. You won't be using any food, however, the room might take a bit longer. And for some of you, that might be worth it. It basically consists of attacking whichever NPC you're attacking and getting out of its render distance by one tile to lose aggro. In each of the tightrope room layouts, there is a set of skulls that you can stand on. And they're all pretty similar, but the skull is usually always there. Now, in this setup, all you have to do is attack the major, for example. Get out of the render distance by standing on these skulls over here. And you can repeat the process. Now, what's annoying about this is the pathing. Sometimes the pathing will be kind of weird and it'll pull you to the left, for example, before it attacks for whatever reason. Uh, so an easy fix around this is attacking it, going on top of the skulls and moving closer manually like this, attacking it and repeating the cycle. The layout to this room is very similar to another type of room layout. The entrance will actually be here and the exit is here. But for demonstration purposes, we got a really nice layout. Now, once the mages is dead, you are probably understanding that you don't want to run all the way to the skulls while attacking the ranger. So there's two ways to do this. The first way is if the exit is over here, you can attack the rangers and go to this little island. 
it's about two tiles over here get up its render distance come back and repeat the cycle now this method is a bit longer than the other method if you were lucky enough to get this layout where the entrance is over here you can be a bit closer you can attack them and go out of its render distance over here as you can see in this layout there is no shadow root however safe spotting still applies in the same manner the tightrope rangers can't reach you around this corner you can attack it freely and go around the corner you're free up till this tile the tile right before the rope is where they can attack you now there is only one exception if the ranger gets trapped on that tile behind another ranger it can attack you from here so you have to either wait for the other ranger to move away or move further back if you get yourself into a sticky situation where more than one NPC is attacking you, or rather even you somehow manage to attack all four, there's a way to lose aggro and not take damage from any of them. The moment you can, run around this corner in this little area, kind of little indent in the wall where none of them can attack you. This is so that you're out of their attack range. Then you can walk along this wall and go to the skull safe spot as per usual. After that, you can come back and everything would have lost aggro. If you ever catch yourself in a sticky situation where you don't want to do the render distance method, uh, there's a way to tick eat against the rangers. For those of you that bring in purple sweets like I do, it's the perfect opportunity to save yourself some food. If for those that only have a few doses of brew left and your only chance is to tick eat, this is your best option. Standing behind the shadow root and tick eating when you can after every single hit. These rangers hit extremely hard, so you have to be very careful on your timing. Upon completion of the room, you can freely cross the tightrope without any of the NPCs attacking you anymore. The keystone will be right here, and you can get however much you want, but I mean, you only ever really need one. Make your way to the exit, and you can click on Dispel Shimmering Barrier, and you're free to go. Very quickly before we move on to the next room, some of you are probably wondering what these tile markers mean. Uh, basically, how the raids work is, uh, if Tyrope wasn't here, Crabs could have been here. So these are my tile markers for if Crabs would have been here. So you can just ignore it in this room. Luring Skeletal Mystics is a lot easier than it might seem. Skeletal Mystics attack with two different attack styles, Magic and Melee. However, its primary style is Magic. Being in its melee range out in the open, and having it not caught on anything, forces it to try and melee you. Doing this, you can manipulate it and get it to safe spot and work in your favor. To start off this fight, you want to protect magic and run out and make sure that it's trying to melee you. It might take a bit, but once it starts doing that, you can actually force it to safe spot. Once that's done, get it to a safe spot. And now it'll be confused on what to attack you with. During this phase, it's more likely to try and melee you, but it can't reach you. So you take infinitely less damage, and you'll save a lot of food going through this fight. There are three different layouts to the Skeletal Mystics room. I got really lucky with this one, and you can actually safe spot one of them, and be completely safe from the other two Skeletal Mystics. However, you won't always have that kind of freedom. To start off this fight, you want to protect magic, run through, and force them to melee, and manipulate them to be safe spotted. This one's already safe spotted, so I can protect magic and run through without it having to try and mage me. As I said, this one's safe spotted, so I don't have to worry about this anymore. Now I have to go in order and safe spot these as well. I get into open melee distance, make sure it tries to mage, uh, melee me, and I can safe spot it. Now that one's free. Now I move on to... Oh, messed up. Alright. Now I move on to this one and make sure this tries to melee me as well. Now I'm free to safe spot them as much as I want. 
I can manipulate them to go wherever I want and they will not try to mage me and I can freely take off my prayers. In each of the three Skeletal Mystic layouts, there are some safe spots that are commonly used, that commonly work, and some safe spots that are 100% going to work. As you can see, I'm in one of them. This safe spot is very commonly used. As you can see, the Skeletal Mystic between two obstacles and it's confused with trying to melee me because I'm in melee distance. This is one of those commonly used safe spots. The next common safe spot in this layout is right over in this corner. It's caught between these two obstacles. It can be stuck over here, and if the uh, rules were flipped, it can be caught just like so as well. After it tries to melee me. The next layout is at the opposite corner, towards the exit. It's the same kind of obstacle where it's caught in between two things. As I said before, it's caught between these two things and it'll work both ways. Whether it's over here or if the Skeletal Mystic spawns on this side, it can work over here as well. Now to discuss the non-static save spots. These save spots are the ones that get a Skeletal Mystic trap on one corner. Uh, as I said before, it depends on how the compass works. So right now, as you can see, the compass is facing north. So that means I can get a trap uh, on this corner in this manner. Now to visually explain this better, I have marked some tiles. It's easier to explain when you see it kind of in like a diamond shape, because as you can see, the skeletal mystic isn't trapped on this rock or whatever. It's trapped over here on this uh, purple thing. And that is basically what is stopping it from trying to melee me. Now, if that's too difficult to understand, uh, there's a way to do it in another manner. Uh, trial and error. And it's pretty much the way that I personally like using it. If the Skeletal Mystic is not trapped in this corner, for example, um, you can just use trial and error and try over here. So let's mark these tiles again, right? Um, in this little diamond shape. Now, because the compass is facing north, I can try and do this, but it will not get trapped. Let's uh, actually do this more properly. Just like that. However, I can try over here. And the Skeletal Mystic will be safe spotted. But on uh, this side, it will be trapped over here, I believe. Let me try and mark the tiles properly. Yeah, just like that. It's uh, trapped on this uh, little purple thing. And uh, because of how the compass working in this raid, it's working properly. Um, so if you're having a hard time understanding that, just try trial and error and eventually you get it safe spotted. If you cannot use the ones that are 100% safe spots. Once you have your Skeleton Mystic in place and it's safe spotted, you want to be in your ranged gear and take up anything that has negative range bonus, such as Promoti Boots. If you have a self amulet EI uh, on you to work on these, make sure to equip that. Now, the reason we don't use a Twisted Bow over the Blowpipe on a Solo Skeletal Mystic is simply because in bigger teams, the Skeletal Mystic's magic level is higher, so the Twisted Bow works better. But in smaller teams, such as a Solo, the magic level isn't as high, so the Blowpipe is actually better DPS than the Twisted Bow. Now, you want to protect magic, and it has a chance to mage you, as you can see here but it's still trying to melee me. So it's more often not going to hit me. It still has a chance to mage me, but this method saves you a lot more food than just face tanking it. This is the second layout of the Skeletal Mystics room. Now there's only one safe spot that's commonly used, but I may as well just go over this one. Uh, this one's kind of out of your way. The entrance is over here, so you'd have to walk all the way over here, so I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, you basically get the Skeletal Mystic trapped over here on this uh, little wall, or purple corner. And of course, vice versa, it'll work the same way if the Skeletal Mystic was over there. Now this next safe spot is the most commonly used. It's in between this rock and this purple column thing, I guess. And of course, vice versa, it'll work uh, both ways. This 
this is the third and final layout of the Skeletal Mystics room. Now, there are a lot of common safe spots and some that will 100% work. So of course, if one safe spot you're trying to use doesn't work, just move on to the next one. Um, this is one of those safe spots caught between these two corners and of course vice versa. It'll be trapped in the other way as well. Now, I'm pretty sure when you have this safe spot, uh, or rather this room, uh, this safe spot will always work, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I could be wrong, but uh, yeah, it's trapped behind this purple thing. I'm pretty sure whenever you get this room, this will always work, but if this doesn't work, just try another one. Um, just moving on quickly over here, this one will work as well. This one is trapped between two, so this will always work. This next one is uh, pretty odd. You're basically using this purple crystal. Uh, you can quickly run behind it, uh, pull it out, and move one square away from the crystal. The other one, you might want to mark your tiles for it. Um, you can get right next to this rock and kind of pay attention. Uh, and then it's one uh, tile over. So first pull it out, stand on that tile, and it'll get trapped on that rock. You don't necessarily need to mark tiles when safe spotting these skeletal mystics, but I'll be doing this for demonstration purposes. This makes it a lot easier to see and visually explained. Right now, as you can see, it's a little too big and a trap between these two areas, as you can see, and it can't fit through this one tile. However, you have to make sure that you have to kind of be in like a diamond kind of shape so that it'll kind of get trapped in between the two. If I stand right here, you can easily see that it'll meal me. And if I stand right here, it can meal me. And if I try to pull over here, it'll be pulled out. It's a lot easier to see it this way. And it's easier to imagine when you're doing consistent safe spots like this one. Now, when going over the shaman's room, I'll be going over the three different methods. I'll be going over the shaman safe spotting. I'll be going over the traditional Tebow slash crossbow kiting, and I'll be going over how to use a blowpipe against these. To visually explain how to force a shaman to jump on you is simple. Because the shaman is more than one tile wide, it can't jump to you if you are right next to a wall. So in order to do this, you have to be in an open area. The shaman has different attack styles. Meleeing, a shaman splat, a ranged attack, and spawning purple spawns but over time it'll eventually jump to you once it gets the chance to now you basically have to be in the wide open as for right here one tile away from all these walls and force it to jump to you just like that because you're one tile away then you can just freely safe spot it by going out of its attack range now i can safely explain how to safe spot a shaman and how it works Basically, with the crossbow and twisted bow, you have a longer range than the shaman's attack range. So even if you're using a rune crossbow, you can attack it from long range, as you can see here. But I need to make this very clear. This is the furthest range that you can be with a rune crossbow to attack it with, or any crossbow on long range. And you have to make sure you have walk on. This is because if you have walk on and you don't want to count the tiles, of course, you'll be immediately brought to the furthest tile. However, if you have run on, there's a chance that it'll bring you closer and the shaman can attack you. Just like that. So again, running on, it'll bring you closer. Walk on will bring you to the furthest top possible. With the twisted bow, however, long range does not add another tile. So you can freely attack the shamans while being on rapid and you can have run on at all times. However, if you want to be safe and you feel like you're doing something wrong, then just have walk on. The first layout we'll be looking at is the one with a pathway with two entrances, one and two. And it looks like this on the minimap. With this layout, you can safe spot a shaman by walking out of the room. Now, in order for this to happen, uh, as you can see, you need to be able to drag a shaman over here and have in a room before that so you can pull it up out of its uh, distance. So for example, let's tag one of these shamans. We're going to pull this to the tundrals, get around the uh, previous room so we can pull it. 
as you can see it's in the corner now it'll kind of get trapped on this gap we can protect the range go through and it'll be safe spotted and from here you can just safe spot with your t-bow crossbow whatever your weapon of choice is if you get this layout but you do not have a room ahead where you can exit the room and lure the shaman into this corner there's another way around it a shaman will normally spawn here and you can tag it and now it'll just be trapped in this little area however you can stay spotted somewhere else there is a gap here and a set of rocks and a pillar if you immediately run on top of the rocks you'll get the shaman trapped right here and you can stay spotted just as normal Every gap that I'll be displaying can be used as a safe spot. As long as you force the shaman to jump on top of you, you can force a safe spot as well. As I stated previously with Skeletal Mystics, there are certain safe spots that only work depending on how the compass is working in that raid. For this layout with the uh, pathway, the pathway has to be to the northeast, as you can see here. First, you want to tag any shaman. Pull it over here, and then you have to run to the entrance where the tendrils are. And as you can see, it'll get trapped around this little rock or skull, I guess. Then you can go back to your previous area. And you can freely safe spot the shaman. This next layout is a pretty annoying layout to safe spot. I would recommend just doing the traditional T-bow slash crossbow kiting method or blow piping. But if you want to safe spot, then go for it. You basically have to safe spot both shamans at the same time. First, get into an open area where it can jump, which is right here. One tile away from all the walls. Now you have to stay spot the second shaman by going over here in this opening. It's one tile away from uh, the purples and uh, kind of like in the opening right there. I might take this hit, but that's fine because I was talking. But yeah, in this sense, you are safe spotting both shamans at the same time and you can freely attack them one by one. Kill this one, and then kill the next one that's uh, over there in the corner. This next shaman layout is a pretty common one. Now, there are some safe spots that only work if the compass is flipped, but I'll be going over the one that'll always work, which is the gap right in front of the door. First, you want to tag a shaman, get its attention, and of course, be in the open area where you're not next to a wall. After it jumps, don't run too far. Make sure it's still aggroed on top of you. And then you can run all the way into the corner. Pull it out if you need to. And now it'll be safe spotted. Now to quickly demonstrate the other safe spot that will not work, uh, depending on how the compass is working. So it's this little indent over here. Um, if the compass was facing north this way, it would work. But uh, as you can see, it's not. So if I try to drag it over here, it'll just walk around. However, the safe spot using this gap will also work. It can jump over to me in the open area. I can kind of trap it around this corner, but make sure it's still aggroed on me. Don't go too fast. Go around the corner and it'll be trapped. Now in this clip, I have the exact same layout, but the compass is flipped. So I can quickly demonstrate what it looks like getting trapped on this gap. First off, go to the safe spot and make it jump towards you. Then just go straight into the corner. And it's safe spotted. 
You can be on this tile or you can be on this tile. But if you want to be safe, just hug the wall and you'll be fine. I'm pretty sure the black gap to the north will work uh, in either layout, even if the compass is facing north. Uh, but if you're looking for a safe spot gap that will always work, this one by the entrance will work regardless. The traditional way of doing shamans is attacking them with either a crossbow or a twisted bow and kiting around them. This is so that you dodge the shaman splats and you don't take any damage from the purple spawns or the melee attack. This is the easiest way to do shamans if you are having troubles with trying to safe spot them. Once you get more wall rounded with this method, you want to kite along the walls. This is so that they do not jump and it speeds up the entirety of your shaman room. The next method is the blowpipe method. The blowpipe method is the most difficult method when doing the shaman room. However, it is the fastest way in doing this room. It is recommended to be against the wall so that it prevents it from jumping. However, you don't necessarily need to be. The moment it does an action, you want to move and attack on the same exact tick. This is so that you dodge all of the shaman splats whenever it happens. However, you don't necessarily need to be against the wall. Now to demonstrate being one tick late. This is the wrong way and the most common mistake people make when doing this method. Guardians is a pretty straightforward room. The higher level pickaxe you have and the higher level mining you have, the more damage you will deal. When you equip your pickaxe, you have to make sure you're on the crush option at the bottom left. How most people like to do this room is attack the guardian and move four tiles away. Just like so. However, there's a better way in terms of saving run energy. Instead of running four tiles, you run four tiles and run one tile closer. The rhythm becomes pretty easy over time, and you'll save yourself some run energy over the long run. So you won't have to stamina all the time for this room. Something I want to add to Guardians is you can actually drag in Warhammer spec and the effect will still go through. Uh, you only want to drag in Warhammer spec if you know you don't have a boss after where you need to, you know, have a dragon Warhammer spec. But if you're feeling like you have the freedom to, then go for it. Basically, it's similar to Kurasks in that even if you hit a zero, you reduce it for what you would have hit. So if you would have hit more than a one, the Dragon Warm spec still applies. And the defense will still be lowered. Now, I understand this is a solo raids guide, but I do want to add this in. If you're doing Guardians with multiple people, uh, you want to have the other person stand on this side. This is so that when the Fallen Rocks fall, they can fall on that tile. The other person, when this Guardian is dead, can do the same thing on this side. And both the falling rocks will only fall on this side. Neither of you will take damage, so it's essentially doing two different guardians at the same time. And of course vice versa, it still works if this one is dead and this guardian is alive.
Tecton is one of the common rooms that a majority of people have problems with. There are two different methods to do Tecton, and they both require some form of timing. However, I realize that learning Tecton can seem extremely daunting, but there's an easy way around it. If you go to the challenge board, make a party, and select challenge mode, you will always get Tecton first. This is because challenge mode has the same rotation and layout every single time. What this means is, you can go in absolute maxed melee gear with whatever food you want and get any amount of practice that you need to do this boss. Tecton has two different phases. The orange phase, which is the base phase, and the red phase, which is when it is enraged. During its orange phase, it is at its most vulnerable. All of its stats are at its lowest. However, when it's enraged in the red phase, all of its stats are heightened. Its attack, strength, and defense. This means that when you're dragging Warhammer or BGS specking, you don't want to spec when it's enraged. The first method is the two-step method. The two-step method is relatively difficult to learn, and you want to do it with either an Elder Maul or a God Sword. You can do it with any six-tick weapon, but it's recommended to do it with either of these two. To begin the fight, you want to be four tiles within Tekdon's range. It'll be pulled from the anvil and you can start your fight. First you want to begin by dragging Warhammer specking, and then you can start the two-step method. The two-step method is essentially attacking Tekdon and walking back to avoid its attacks. This is so that you are constantly on Tekdon to prevent it from walking back to the anvil, and you're also dodging its attacks. This method can be extremely difficult to master, but it is the best method when facing Tekdon. You can still do the two-step method with the God Sword, but the Elder Maul is better. I'm pretty sure you want to be on the Slash option rather than the Crush option, because most of the God Sword's accuracy lies with Slash. You might decide to do the two-step method with any other weapon, however it isn't recommended. Weapons like the Dragon Warhammer are terrible DPS when doing this, as well as the Zamoraki and Hasta. Because you're avoiding every other hit, you're actually losing hits with the Hasta. This goes with the Abyssal Bludgeon as well. When facing Tekdon, it's important to understand why Tekdon goes back to the Anvil. When you're doing the two-step method, you're basically being scanned by Tekdon the moment you're on top of it. Tekdon scans if there's any players next to it, and if there's no players next to it, it'll go back to the Anvil. So in this sense, we're dodging attacks and being scanned on the exact tick. However, if you think you're doing it right, but Tekdon is going back to the anvil, you're doing it wrong. If you miss it by a single tick and try to fix it, it'll just go back. After some time, it'll go back to the anvil. This is when it'll recharge some HP and defense. Now meteors will fall out of the sky, or rather the lava. You can decide to dodge it by moving every two tiles, or you can just walk in a straight line. An easy way to dodge the meteors is clicking when they explode on the floor. Another method is simply walking in a 3x3 square. This is so that you can constantly keep yourself moving and not have to think about when to click. You might want to wait a tick after every click, but you'll never take any damage this way. Once Tekdon gets off the anvil, it'll become enraged. During this phase, all of its stats are heightened, including its defense. This means that you do not want to drag in Warhammer spec. However, during its battle phase, it'll turn orange, its base form. This is when you can freely drag in Warhammer spec.
The next method is the four tick method. The four tick method is the most common method when players do not own an Elder Maul. And I'm pretty sure it's better DPS than a God Sword. You do this method with either a Whip, Zamorak, and Hasta, or an Abyssal Bludgeon. If you have the Zamorak and Hasta, I would highly recommend using this over the Whip, because the Whip only has slash options. With the Zamorak and Hasta, it has a crush option at the bottom left. The Abyssal Bludgeon is also a crush weapon as well, and it's better DPS than the Zamorak and Hasta if you wish to bring it in. Now, thanks to our good friend Wooks, who actually gave me permission to use this image, we have a beautiful image to explain how to do the 4 tick method when facing Tekton. Now, I cannot stress this enough. This method needs to be done counterclockwise. If you try to do it clockwise, Tekton has a chance to still attack you and you will take damage. So you need to do this method counterclockwise. I will be doing a live demonstration of this method. But first, we need to understand what this image means. Tekton will face the last direction that you were at, whether it's north, south, east, or west. And there are four tiles on each side that it can attack you on. These tiles are the tiles that it scans you on, as I explained before. Now, Wooks has highlighted the last tiles on each corner going counterclockwise. These are the tiles that you want to be on before turning. Essentially, when you're on this tile and Tekton turns on you, the moment it's going to attack or about to attack, you want to move to the next side. You can either run the next three tiles or walk the next three tiles before going on the last highlighted tile. When you're attacking Tekton, the moment it faces you and attacks you, you want to move to the next tile and repeat the process going counterclockwise. I've made one change to his image, and I've added red tiles. These red tiles are the tiles that you do not want to be on for more than one tick. If you are on these tiles, Tekton will not face you and will not attack you. It cannot scan you, and thus it'll just go back to the anvil because it is assuming that you are not next to it. You will not have marked tiles like I do, however this will make it visually easier to understand. Four sides with four tiles on each side. Now you want to make sure you are dodging and anticipating each attack before moving on to the next side. Being on the last tile before it doesn't attack. The same applies with the Abyssal Bludgeon. The Abyssal Bludgeon is the exact same attack speed as the Whip and the Zamorak and Hasta, but much more superior than the Whip. It's comparable to the Zamorak and Hasta, but I'm pretty sure it's better. Now this is what it looks like if you go on the wrong tile. Because you go on the wrong red tile, Tekdon cannot scan you here, and thus goes back to the anvil because it assumes there are no players around. There are plenty of different ways to do this room, and the safe spots, again, matter depending on how the compass is working in that raid. When doing this room, you have to make sure you have your bronze axe on you. Personally, what I like to do is bring my mage gear. However, I don't bring ancestral. I wear full bandos for the range defense. When you're going inside, protect the range, and you can cut the tree. If the mud is closed, you can protect melee. And what you can actually do is... Flick prayers the moment you can. Personally, I just like to camp whatever prayer. The wood cutting tips are always static. So once you get an XP drop, you can attack the mudder doll. You don't want to damage it too much as at 50% HP, it'll just heal. There are common ways to do this like mealing as well to save yourself some scales. Now you can also do it with the blowpipe as well. You can fit about two hits of the blowpipe before going back onto the tree.
when the tree is cut down there are a different couple ways to attack the small mother down you can choose to range it you can use to be in max melee and scythe it down or you can just continue maging it as you were earlier now in this specific layout there's a safe spot from the bigger mother doll as you can see the smaller mother doll is attacking me but i'm constantly getting maged by the bigger mama doll this is the only layout where you can do this by the exit you can stand behind this crystal and the mama doll can't attack you anymore now from here you can either choose to mage it with the trident which is what i personally like to do or if it gets close enough i can switch into my range gear and blow pipe from here and once it gets close enough protect melee An alternative to just safe spotting the smaller mother doll is protecting melee and constantly kiting under it. This is because the smaller mother doll can sometimes walk away from you and it's kind of annoying. You want to protect melee because when you protect melee it's 100% protection whereas the range protection is partial protection. Now all you have to do is protect melee and run one tile under it and just constantly repeat the cycle. It's really not that difficult and it stops it from you know trying to run away and ranging you. And you take quite a bit less damage if you're not going to try and safe spot it. Once you've defeated the smaller mother doll, the bigger mama doll will come out of the water. It can attack with range, mage, and melee. But the melee hit is extremely deadly. It can do a stomp attack where it can actually hit like pretty much over 90, I'm pretty sure. Even if you're protecting melee, it can actually stomp and damage you through your prayer. So you have to be extremely careful. Just like that. Luckily, I was hit a 1 there, but some others cannot be that lucky. The ways to safe spot it are, again, dependent on how the compass works. And I can actually show you without actually knowing what the compass looks like. So let's see how it follows me. You can see that it's kind of following me to the north a bit. So that means you can see that it can get trapped on this wall because it's facing the north side. A safe spot works here, but that's only if north is facing that way. As you can see, it gets trapped on this wall because of how the compass is working. And I can freely attack it without worrying about it mealing me. If I get unlucky, it'll start to kite around and try to melee me. So if that happens, you'll just have to protect melee and run through it. Now, as you can see in this layout, the northern side is facing towards the water. So as I said before, there's a safe spot right here. The moment that it gets out of the water, you can see how it's being dragged. And as you can see, it'll be dragged towards the north against the wall. And then it'll get trapped right on this corner. And of course, if I try to go over here, the mother doll will not get trapped. It can freely melee me. If you ever get into a sticky situation, both mother dolls can be ticky eat against. Personally, I bring in purple sweets. However, I know that not everybody brings in purple sweets. So if you have brews and you want to save them, you might want to ticky eat. When facing Vasa, it's important to have your melee gear with a stab weapon, as well as your ranged gear. The twisted bow is best in slot, however if you don't own a twisted bow, the blowpipe is your next best option. People speculate if a dragon warhammer is worth it, however it's not worth it if you have a twisted bow. If you have a blowpipe, I would recommend dragon warhammer specking. Now you only want to dragon warhammer spec if you don't have a boss next that you need to spec down. So for example, if I had Tekton next, it's probably not the best option to Dragon Warhammer spec here. However, for the rest of the raid, if you don't have a boss like that, then you can feel free to use your specs. A common method when doing Vasa is bringing in a rune pouch and venging it. When it teleports you, it'll hit you for your max hit minus 5. However, you don't need to bring it in. 
if Vasa is your first room, you might decide to Venge and then bank your rune pouch. Now, it's important to understand when Vasa determines what HP it's going to hit you at. The moment it teleports you, it's already decided what it'll hit you for, so you can eat up right after you get teleported. Before starting off your fight with Vasa, you'll want to make sure you are in your ranged gear, you're potted up, and you've venged if you have the venge runes. After it teleports you, it's already decided what it'll hit you for. So at this point right now, it'll hit me a 94 and I can eat up. Spam click it, and the moment it starts moving, dodge all of its attacks. It attacks with range, so you want to protect the range and constantly kite around it. Now it'll go on to these crystals. Once it reaches these crystals, it'll heal its HP and defense. Now, you want to make sure when you're attacking this crystal, you want to be on the stab option. What's important to understand is the total amount of time it takes for Vasa to get off a crystal is about 40 seconds. So, for example, if it spends 20 seconds on this crystal, I kill it. 20 seconds on the other crystal and I don't kill it, it'll move off the crystal and teleport me once again. For demonstration purposes, I will not be attacking this crystal. And after 40 seconds, it'll just get off of it and try to teleport me again. Because I unsuccessfully killed the crystal, Vasa healed up a lot and will teleport me again. As I said before, it'll hit me for max HP minus 5, so at this point, it'll hit me for a 20. I can eat up and repeat the process. Now you can normally time and kill about two crystals. So once Vasa reaches the third crystal, you should probably just stay in your ranged gear and just wait for it to get off the crystal. Now I'll be demonstrating what it looks like to use the blowpipe at Vasa. It's the same thing as the Tebow when you're kiting, however, you're moving every two tiles. A niche method to do is using your crossbow on the final hit right before it gets to the crystal after you're using your blowpipe. This next method is a pretty weird method. I personally only ever do this in duo skilled to five man skilled solo raids, but you can do them in regular solo raids as well. There's a way to attack Vasa during its teleportation phase when it's supposed to be invulnerable. However, not only can you damage it, but you can completely skip that event and not take any damage from its teleportation attack. Once Vasa gets off the crystal and tries to teleport you, you can start attacking it and make your way towards the exit. Once you've gotten about two hits in, you can go through the fire and make sure you're not too close. Gauge how much time it takes for it to go to the middle and go back into the room. As you can see, we can actually attack it when it's supposed to be invulnerable and dodge all of the teleporting damage. When dealing with this room, you must follow the combat triangle. You want to mage the melee, melee the ranger, and range the major. You can easily tell which is which by looking at uh, their hands. The major has no hands, the melee has all these hands, and the ranger has hands but with rocks. When dealing with vanguards, I recommend staying in each corresponding corner. However, the two closest corners to the exit is what I recommend the most. This is so that if you end up going into a bad situation, you can immediately leave and eat up before dying. When dealing with each vanguard, you want to keep them all within the same 33% HP region, or 30% is a good number. If you do too much damage to one vanguard, they'll end up healing to full HP, every single one of them, and you'll have to start from the beginning. As long as you stay focused on your damage control, you'll be completely fine. Again, you don't want to do too much damage to one vanguard, so making minor changes like using the blowpipe over the T-bow, 
or using incredible reflexes over piety will make a huge difference. Vanguards is pretty straightforward. However, it is also the most annoying room to do in my opinion, because one mistake can mean you're starting from the very beginning. However, there's only one thing that's a bit different from each vanguard. The ranged vanguard is the only vanguard where you can stand under it, and it won't try to kite around and move its position to try and attack you. This means that once you're done damaging the vanguard enough, you can switch to another vanguard by maging the melee or t-bowing the major, but being very careful with your damage control. Mind you, no other vanguard can do that. If you try to stand under the melee, for example, it'll just kite around you and start attacking you as well. The next clip is just a sped up example of a vanguard room. So if you want to completely ignore that, you can move on to the next section of the video. Before going into the Vespulon room, it's important to be using the proper gear. The Twisted Bow is the best method, however I'll be going over the Mage method and the Crossbow method later after this layout. There are three different layouts to the Vespula room and uh, I'll be going over the first layout. Before going into this room, it's important to either have a Prayer Enhance or extra Restores. You can brute force your way through the portal using Restores, However, if Vespula is your first room, uh, you might want to bring in an extra prayer potion or two. If you're using the ranged method, make sure your quick prayers are set to redemption in whichever ranged prayer you're using. As I said before, the prayer enhance helps out a lot. You're using the redemption method, so your prayer will go back down to zero. But because you have a prayer enhance, it'll restore your prayer by one every few seconds. When going inside the room, you want to immediately tag the portal so that the Vespula doesn't keep attacking the grubs. As you can see, it's attacked the one grub. That means if this grub reaches zero HP, a Vespula and soldier will spawn and you'll have to take care of it, and the Vespula portal will heal again. As long as you're constantly attacking the portal, the Vespula will just constantly do this weird humping animation, uh, so it'll never attack the grubs. Now, in order to avoid the grubs respawning, there will always be metabamia roots towards the exit. It takes about 3 or 4 to completely heal up a grub. So if you find yourself having trouble with the grub, you know, dying and it has to uh, heal, you might want to grab those and fill it all the way up. The safe spot in this room is over here by the first grub. If you try to stand on the other side or even one step closer, you'll take more damage from Vespula. Constantly repeat the cycle and attack the portal. Your redemption will save you, but if you have your prayer enhance, your prayer will go up by one, and you can quickly turn on your quick prayers again, and constantly flick. Now, the method that I personally like using is just constantly brute forcing. If you have extra prayer potions, like I do for example, you can just constantly drink them once your prayer runs out, and uh, reset the cycle.
You may want to end up using a stamina for this room, but if you have purple sweets like I do, you don't necessarily have to. But the majority of the time, you'll need to stamina potion. When you're brute forcing Vespula and doing the redemption method by constantly drinking prayer potions or restores, there's a glitch where your prayer will still be active and you have to double click. It's an extremely annoying glitch, but you just have to be aware by paying very close attention to your quick prayers at the top right. Now, when doing Vespula, you have to be extremely tile specific. If you are even one tile off, it'll screw up the entire thing and your redemption won't pop. So on this tile, you will always get hit less than 10. So your redemption will always pop as you can see here. But if I try to stand on this tile, as you can see, I got a random nine there, which could kill me. And if I stand on this tile, Same concept goes. So you always need to be on the safe spot tile and not one tile further or one tile closer. The next two methods heavily depend on whether or not you have a Kodai Potion, Overload, or if Vespula is the first room in your raid. The Linguini Staff or the Trident Staff is the best method if you have a Kodai slash Overload. However, if Vespula is the first room in your raid, you can choose to pre-imbued Heart and go inside, and the Trident and Linguini Staff is still the best option. However, if you don't have any of those, the Crossbow Method is your best option when using a ranged potion. The safe spot is a little different in this room, but it's on this tile, one square before the grub in this layout. This time we're actually going to be doing the crossbow way with a different safe spot because it's a different layout. As I said before, have your quick prayers set and pay very close attention to what weapon you're using. The orbital crossbow is the only crossbow with an extra range tile, so you can use it on rapid. But any other crossbow you'll need it to be on long range. Make sure to immediately attack the portal and go to this safe spot. In this layout it's a bit odd, but it's right in front of the grub as per usual. Make sure you're on the right grub and not this one or that one. The time it takes to prepare for Ulm varies differently per person, but I'll be making sure to run down where everything is and how to prep the amount of supplies you need for the great Ulm fights. The first thing we have here are the old tools. Pretty self-explanatory. You can take all of them and you can rake your seeds at the end of floor. This is the end of floor right before the Ulm fight. You can decide to rake your seeds here and you can restore your run energy in this energy wall as well. In each resource room, there'll be a gourd tree and a geyser. You can right click pick lots to gourd tree. You can fill up your inventory and fill them all up with water vials.
The farming patch is always located next to the tools and can be found by looking for the farming icon on your minimap. You can harvest your herbs here by planting the corresponding seeds. For those of you that are just learning to solo raid, I would highly recommend over prepping. This is so that you can suicide more supplies inside of Ulm and have a better chance of surviving. To start off, we're going to start making the overloads. I've assorted my inventory to make it visually easier to explain, but it doesn't need to be similar. First off, you're going to need 3 Gulpars, 1 Noxifer, and 3 Water Filled Gourd Vials to make one overload, as well as the corresponding secondaries. To make one, you have to make sure you make the Elder Potions first, using the Stinkhorn Mushrooms. After that's finished, you make the Kodak Potions with the Endarkened Juice, the purple secondary. After that, Twisted Potions with the Sicily. After that, it's just as easy as using the Noxifer on the potions. Be very careful not to click the potions before the herb, because you'll probably drink it and you'll have to start all over. Use the Noxifer on any of the three uh, boost potions, and you'll make yourself an overload. Prepping supplies for Ulm is just as easy as making the overloads. However, some people kind of get confused with three different secondaries. Personally, I like to think of the red stinkhorn mushroom as the restores, because it's pretty much the similar color schemes. After that, I look at the Endarkened Juice and look at the cork on the top. It reminds me of a yellowish color like the brew, and this is what you need to make the brews. The remaining one is Sicily, and this is what you use to make prayer enhances. If this is your first time learning solo raids, I would highly recommend suiciding supplies inside of Ulm, and you have a higher chance of surviving, and you won't lose as many points. Over time, you won't need the supplies as much in the middle, and eventually you'll just stop grabbing them all together. At that point, you can stop suiciding your supplies and start going into the ohm with just your inventory alone. I recommend suiciding in the middle of the room and dropping the supplies instead of just dying. This is so that you have a separate pile of your supplies and it's visually easier to grab if everything seems to become too hectic. You can ignore this item in the bottom right as it's just an oculus orb. I use this item to make my solo raids guide so don't worry about it too much. Once you've finished prep, you're finally ready to take on the Great Ulm. Make sure to have all your gear on you and don't forget anything, because if you do, you can't actually leave the room during the middle of the fight unless you die. I like to keep my mage gear at the top while equipping my melee gear. I like to keep my range gear at the bottom. You don't use range until the final phase, so it's easier to have it at the bottom, in my opinion. If you do not have the twisted bow, make sure you have your dragon hunter crossbow or your blowpipe on you. Because I use the Twisted Bow, I can bake my Blowpipe freely. If you're just learning, make sure you have both your Staminas on you. Make sure you have 4 Restores, 1 Overload, and 1 Enhance, and all the brews you need. Once you really get used to solo raids, you'll only ever really need 3 Restores, 1 Prayer Enhance, and 1 Overload. But for the sake of learning, I would bring in 4. Every time you drink your Overload, you need to make sure you drink your Enhance. Try to keep them matched up, at all times. First you want to Overload, and drink a full brew right when you can. After the brew is over, you can drink a restore and drop it or put it in the chest. If you're just learning, you can replace your overload and enhance because the fight might take a bit longer than you expected. Once that's finished, fill the rest of your inventory up with brews and you're ready to go down and face the ohm. This next tip is only for people that are using third-party clients, which I assume most people are. Um, when you drink your overload, the overload boosts your stats up every 15 seconds. So the next time it'll boost it is at 445. So I can brew up as much as I want. And as long as I make it in time for 445, it'll boost me right there. So every 15 seconds is when you either want to brew up and just wait for the timing to go down and uh, you'll always be overloaded which speeds up all of your runs by just a little bit so the next 15 seconds at 430 and your booster back up the great ohm is the most difficult challenge when facing the chambers of Zarek, and with it comes a lot of different mechanics and time spent if there is one thing i can tell anyone learning solo raids is to take their time and not get too angry with themselves 
as doing a solo ohm is much more difficult than doing it in a team. First, I'll be going over the three different phases that ohm can rise with during your fights. Before starting your fight, it is very important to understand how the phases work in a solo raid. In a solo raid, you get three phases. The first phase, the second phase, and the final phase. But there are three different types of phases as well. The three different phases are the crystal phase, the acid phase, and the flame phase. Each phase specific attack only happens on that phase as well as the final phase. Because there are three phases, you'll only get two different phases and the final phase. Which means one raid you can have the crystal phase and the acid phase including the final phase, or vice versa, the acid phase, the flame phase, and the final phase. The two phases that it chooses is random, so you can't really predict what phase you're going to get. There are only two different phase specific attacks depending on which phase you get, and it is very important in understanding what they do and how to avoid them. During the crystal phase, there is the falling crystals and the crystal bomb. During the acid phase, there is the acid drip and the acid spray. And during the flame phase, there is the flame burn and the flame wall. During the final phase, all phase specific attacks can happen. This means that the Great Ohm doesn't actually rise with the phase. It can tag you with falling crystals, throw crystal bombs at you, tag you with acid drip, spray acid at you, tag you with flame burn, and even throw a flame wall. Sometimes the melee hand will heal, but you can actually avoid that and skip cycles which I will be explaining later. After you've defeated the final phase, the head phase will happen, and you'll be needing to range that phase. Falling crystals will happen and that's an area of effect which you need to dodge. And again, all phase specific attacks can happen all at once during this. During your fight, the Great Ohm has non-phase specific attacks. This means that all of these attacks can happen on any phase regardless of what you're doing. These attacks include the Lightning Stun, the Portal Switch, and the Crystal Burst, which are considered special attacks. The regular base attacks include the Range Attack, Magic Attack, and Deadly Spheres. Along with all of its other attacks, the Great Ohm will fire Deadly Spheres at you, and it is important in understanding what these spheres do, the different kind of spheres, and how to avoid them. There are three different kind of spheres. The Sphere of Regression, which is the Melee Sphere, the Sphere of Accuracy and Dexterity, which is the Ranged Sphere, and the Sphere of Magical Power, which is the Mage Sphere. If you take a hit and you're unprotected by the Sphere, 50% of your current HP will be drained. If you protect against it and pray successfully, none of your HP will be drained. If your prayer is activated, 50% of your prayer is drained and your prayer is disabled. So for example, if I'm protecting magic and a Sphere of Aggression fires at me, my prayer will be taken off and I have to quickly protect from melee as soon as I can. If your prayer is deactivated for whatever reason, no prayer gem will occur, but you still need to protect against the corresponding sphere. There will be a message in your chat box that tells you when you are being attacked by a certain sphere, so pay very close attention to it. When starting off the fight, the Great Ohm will rise with a phase. As you can see, it's already risen with the crystal phase, as I've already suicide supplies for the sake of the video. The safe spots are very tile specific. If you're even one tile off, you can mess up, so it's important to understand how they work and where the tiles are. Using tile markers helps out a lot, and I recommend marking them if you can. The first safe spot is to the right, and it's on the ring finger of the melee hand. The middle safe spot is over here by the head in this indent, and the mage safe spot is right here by this indent. Standing right in the middle area will make a turn to the middle, standing on this tile to the left will make a turn all the way to the left, and standing on this tile to the right will make a phase all the way to the right. Doing this means you can take absolutely no damage and manipulate how much damage you actually take. When the ohm is facing the middle, you can easily see where it's going to attack. It's between the left safe spot and the right safe spot. This entire area is vulnerable, so standing even one square here will make sure you're safe. If it faces the left, it can attack this entire area from the middle safe spot all the way to the left. When it's facing the right, it can attack from this area all the way to the right. The reason you want to kill the mage hand before the melee hand, and why you cannot do 4-0 to zero on any other phase besides the final, is because if you hit anything over a 30 with the uh, melee hand, it'll just cripple itself. And then you can't attack it anymore. So you basically have to kill the mage hand before you kill the melee hand. The ohm has two base attacks, the magic and range attack. However, they work in a pretty odd way. You can never predict what it's going to attack with, but you can kind of work with your best odds. 
First, I'm going to protect magic and see what it attacks me with. It attacked with magic, and right now its next attack is most likely to attack me with magic. That doesn't mean 100%, but it's most likely. The moment it attacks me with range, however, is the moment I want to switch. You can never predict what attack style it'll attack with, so you're just going to have to basically take an L until it decides to switch attack styles. As you can see there, now I protect ranged, and its next attack will most likely be ranged. This is a sphere of aggression. As you can see, I turned off my prayers, drained my prayer by half, and I didn't take any damage because I prayed against it successfully. Again, in the chat box, it shows you a little message telling you exactly what sphere it's attacking you with. As of right now, I currently have my prayers disabled, but I'll be doing this for demonstration purposes. When the ohm fires an orb at me, my prayers will not be drained. However, as you can see, it damages me for half of my current HP. Now going over Ohm's special attacks, which are Ohm's non-phase specific attacks. These attacks can happen on any phase, and they work in a cycle. So they'll constantly repeat themselves over the fight. These attacks include the Lightning Stun, the Portal Swap, and the Crystal Burst. Lightning is very easy to dodge, as it's just moving on to another tile. Being on this tile, I just move one square this way, and I can dodge it. But there's a way to do it another way. If you time it right, you can run right through it. It takes a bit of practice, but I wouldn't recommend doing it if you're just learning. Failing to dodge lightnings mean it'll turn off all your prayers, and you'll take a bit of damage and you can't move for some time. Combined with other attacks, it can be kind of scary, so I wouldn't recommend running through it unless you're confident. Right after the lightning stun, the portal swap will happen. During the portal swap, you have to immediately zoom out and find the portal. For every tile you are away, you will take 5 damage, however if you're directly on top of it, you won't take any damage. You can always tell when to move off the moment you can. After stepping directly onto it, pay attention to your chat box. The moment a message says the teleport attack has no effect, you can run off. If timing it properly, you won't take any damage. After the portal swap, crystal outburst will happen. Crystals will spawn under your feet, and it's as easy as dodging it by moving one tile. However, if you don't dodge it, you'll take quite a bit of damage. Once you've completed the phase, the mid phase will happen. Falling crystals will fall out of the ceiling, and they are an area of effect. As long as you move between two tiles, you'll be safe. It's not like the Theater of Blood's bloat where you can run on the same tile after it's landed, so make sure you're constantly moving and pay very close attention to the shadows. On the final phase of Ulm, another special attack will be added into the cycle. It'll be lightning, portals, and then the hand will start healing. You can try to attack the hand, but you'll only heal it. So you want to make sure that whenever it's healing, do not do any damage on this hand at all. Now, on the final phase of Ulm, even though we are introduced to a completely new special in the cycle, the cycle still continues as normal. However, if we turn the head at the same time a special occurs, you can actually skip the special and create an empty event. This is called skipping cycles or skipping specials, as when you skip the special, it moves on to the very next special in the cycle. Knowing this, we can manipulate it and actually skip certain attacks, doing methods like 4 to 1, 3 to 1, etc., which will be explained later. Knowing this can also mean that we completely skip the healing hand and we can constantly damage the melee hand without having to worry about it ever healing. But first, we must determine where we are in the cycle. Now that we know where we are in the cycle, we can determine that the healing hand will happen right after the portal swap. In order to skip the healing effect, we must turn the head the moment it's supposed to happen. As you can see, we just skip the healing effect. This means we can attack the hand freely and not worry about it healing. However, the cycle still continues, and the crystal outburst will happen right now. At the time of making this video, it's important that I go over the healing graphical issue. This is a graphical glitch that occurs when doing the ohm fights, and it still isn't fixed today, but if it still isn't fixed, I should go over it. With each special attack, a certain icon appears over the ohm's hand. The lightning, the portal, the crystal outburst, everything. As you can see, that is the portal icon, and that means I need to go to the portals. After this will be the healing hand icon. What's important to understand is, if you skip the crystal effect, for whatever reason, the healing icon will still stay. So just watch us skip the crystal attack. We just skip the crystal attack, but the healing icon is still there. We can freely attack the hand, however, it's not healing. 
This is simply just a graphical issue and can be completely ignored. Running the mid-chain is a very important method when doing solar raids. Even if you're a tick off, you mess it up. There's a couple ways to run the mage hand, and I'll be making sure to demonstrate each and every possible way. When doing the mage hand, it's important to understand that if you're even one tile off and you're not tile perfect, you will mess up the entire thing and you'll have to start from the beginning. The most common way to start is start from the long range at the ring finger. When you start, the moment Olm's head turns is the same tick you want to click on the mage hand. After that, run to the middle safe spot and run back to the thumb area. Run back to the long range style and rinse and repeat. You attack the mage hand not when you see a turn, but the moment it does turn, on the same exact tick. So for example, you see that we attack and the head moves on the exact same tick. You can constantly continue the cycle and not lose any ticks at all as the timing for the head turning is the same as the trident. However, this is what it looks like if you try attacking the moment you see it turn. You'll be late every single time, and that's the exact opposite of what you want to do. But it's definitely worth the learn. When doing the mage hand, there are a lot of common mistakes that are made doing this. This is the most common method, but I see people making mistakes when running from the long range style to the middle tile, constantly get hit by Ulm and wonder what they're doing wrong. The number one thing I can say is, the second you run from the long range tile and get an XP drop, immediately go to the middle tile. As you can see here, I'll always make it in time. But the mistake is this. What I see often is that they'll attack the mage hand, but wait a bit before clicking middle safe spot. So it looks like this. It looks like they're on time, but they're really not. The second method to mage run is a bit more complicated but 100% worth learning. What's interesting about the Trident and the Sanguinesi Staff is, depending on what range you used it on, you can kind of get teleported, and I'll show you why. Basically, as I said before, you have to be tick perfect with the first method. But if you click one tile away and time it properly, you'll actually get teleported and make it in time somehow, even if you're further away. The same goes for the closer method. If I'm one tick off and I click one tile ahead, like so, you'll actually teleport here. It's a very interesting way because if you continue it, you can do the old mage method, but continue the cycle as normal, as long as you're one tile ahead, just like that. It works in an interesting manner, but it's 100% worth learning. This is what it would look like if I splashed on the mage hand and I wasn't sure if the head was going to stay in the middle or turn left. It has a chance to do either. As you can see, I'm going to attack the mage hand but not get an XP drop. I have to try and catch myself and save myself to the left. But if it actually splashes and it turns to the left, this is what I do. Predict is going to go to the middle but I can quickly save myself and go to the right. Doing it this way saves you damage, and you can quickly get yourself into the same cycle. There are two different methods to continuing the cycle once you've splashed. The first way is the most recommended, as you don't lose any DPS. However, you take a little bit of damage. It's simple as just not doing anything and just taking a hit right here. You continue the cycle as normal, but you might take a little extra damage. The second method is a bit different, as you mage the melee hand. 
It's only really worth it if you have a Sanguinesti Staff, but you're most likely to splash anyways. Once you've splashed and go to the long range tile, mage the melee hand and it'll drag you just as if you mage the mage hand. This method isn't that recommended, but it exists if you want to use it. When starting off your fight with the Great Ulm, it's common to be in your melee gear so that you can go straight to the melee hand and Dragon Warhammer spec. However, when you become more well rounded with solo raids and learn how to run the mage and melee hand, there's a way to start off your fight to get the most amount of DPS as you can. The starting phase for the Great Ulm is slightly different from any other phase. It has a random chance of spawning on the west side or the east side. However, there is a way to tell. If you pay attention closely, you can kind of see a shadow spawn on either side of the hole. So you have to pay very close attention. Depending on which side it spawns from, you need to run to the long range pinky tile of which side. So if it spawns on this side, you have to be on this tile. And if it spawns on this side, you have to be on that tile. Now, as I said before, it's a bit different from any other phase. The moment the head comes up, the head is already turning towards you. So you need to start the cycle the moment you have an attack option at the top left. The moment I see the text option, switch into my Dragon Warhammer and continue into the cycle. It's a more advanced method of doing things, but it's probably the best method in terms of not losing any DPS. Now I understand some people have problems when seeing the shadow when the Great Ulm comes up. So I guess if you're having difficulties, play with your best odds. When starting off any other phase, it's pretty simple. You know that it's going to spawn on the opposite side. However, when you start, you can actually land two mage hits and then get into the Dragon Warhammer cycle. As you can see, I did the method where I'm one tile closer because I'm a tick off, but it saves myself by doing it properly. During the crystal phase, it can throw bombs at you. The bombs are area of effect, and the further you are away, the less damage you take, or no damage at all. If you stand on top of it, however, you'll be taking a huge 60 to the face. Sometimes Ulm will tag with Fallen Crystals. To dodge them, it's just as easy as moving one tile every few ticks. I'll be demonstrating how to constantly do DPS to the Great Ulm as you're dodging these Fallen Crystals. Getting crystals while doing the melee hand is pretty common. However, if you're constantly moving, you won't lose any DPS, and you're constantly dodging the crystals at the same time. This is the acid splat. There's nothing really special to it. Just so long as you don't stand on the tiles that are acided, you won't get damaged. But if you do, you'll take constant damage. If Ulm tags you with acid, turn off your walk and walk around the room. For beginners, this is probably the best method. There are ways to damage Ulm while dodging the acid path, but for now, the best method is just to walk around and wait until the acid disappears. If you manage to get the acid walk during the mage running phase, it can be pretty annoying. But as long as you continue it and constantly dodge damage, you won't lose any DPS. And with some practice, it becomes very easy. This is the Ulm's burn attack. There's nothing you can do to dodge it or avoid it, you just kinda have to take it. 
The burn will damage you for 5 damage and lower your stats every few seconds. And you'll get about 5 burn with me's before it dissipates. This is the Ohm's flame wall attack. In order to get out, douse the closest flames to you and run either side. As long as you have your water spells on you, you're perfectly safe. The first method in avoiding the flame wall is simple. The flame wall is 3 tiles wide. So as long as you are either against the wall or leading up to it while attacking the melee hand, the flame wall has no space to spread. You know you've done it successfully when the great ohm fires an empty attack at you, almost like an empty event, and nothing happens. Just like so. This means that the flame wall would have happened, however you've dodged it successfully and nothing has happened. The second method in avoiding the flame wall is the method that I personally like using. However, it requires a bit of timing. When attacking the melee hand, as long as you move every single time it's about to attack, just like the mage hand, you can anticipate it coming. Doing methods like 3 to 1 or 4 to 1 uh, utilizes this very well, and I'll get into that very shortly. Now to go over the different melee hand methods. The first method is the 1 to 0 method. And it's the method that I recommend most, when learning, at least. I would recommend learning this method before doing methods like 3 to 1 and 4 to 1, as it helps a lot with your timing and when to skip the events, as you can see I'm doing now. This method is most commonly done with the Elder Maul and the God Sword, and you can do it with the Scythe of a Tur. However, if you're using the Scythe, you're most likely going to be doing the 3 to 1 method, which will be explained later. To start this method, go to the middle safe spot, click the melee hand, Go to the ring finger right after and rinse and repeat. It's a pretty simple concept and you take absolutely no damage. However, there are common mistakes that I see when doing this hand. The first thing is, you want to make sure the moment the XP drop happens, you're clicking on the ring finger tile at the exact same time or around the same time. So if you pay attention, XP drop and my click happen at around the same time. A tip I can give you guys is, if you're on rune light and you're using tile markers, the moment you see the tile disappear, that basically means your character is there and you're free to click away. The moment that disappears, click the melee hand, go back, disappears, go back, disappears, go back, disappears, go back. It's pretty simple to learn and highly recommend doing this before learning any other melee method. I can't stress enough that when doing the 1 to 0 method, you need to be on the middle safe spot. And I'll show you why. If you try to start on the ring finger, attack the hand, and then go to the middle safe spot, you'll get hit every single time. The method is basically mandatory to start in the middle safe spot, attacking the melee hand, going to the ring finger, and rinse and repeating that way. Not starting from here, and running over here. The tip that I want to give for 1 to 0 is you want to click the melee hand the moment the head turns and not when you see it turn, similar to the mage hand. So for example, the same exact time it turns, just like that. Again, the same exact time it turns. Now this is what it'll look like if you attack the hand after you see it turn. You will never make it in time to the ring finger. And that is the incorrect way of doing it. Now we'll be taking a look at the 3 to 1 method. The 3 to 1 method is superior to the 1 to 0 method, as it speeds up your fight by quite a bit. 3 to 1 basically means you're giving the Ohm hand 3 hits while taking 1 hit from the Ohm head. Something that's important to understand when doing this method is, you need to constantly skip the events, as you see here, while also doing DPS to the melee hand. You'll also see me taking a step back, as it's to anticipate any crystals falling, or the acid walk. You'll also see me running at the exact same time the Ohm makes an attack, and this is to anticipate the flame wall, as I've explained earlier.
As you can see, I'm doing three hits to the main hand while I'm taking one from the ohm. I'm also standing right here and running the moment it attacks to anticipate the flame wall and dodge it. The 3 to 1 method is 100% worth learning, but only after you finish learning the 1 to 0 method. And as you see there, I just anticipated the flame wall. Now I will be demonstrating how to skip cycles and determine where you are in the cycle live. As you can see on the left, you can follow along with me and it's very easy to understand visually. As you can see, we just got the crystal outburst. So we'll get a base attack, an empty event right now, and then another base attack. After that, we'll get the lightning stun special. We'll get another base attack, an empty event, another base attack, and right after the portal swap. Once portal swap is over, we get another base attack, another empty event, a base attack, and then the hand will start to heal. Again, another base attack, an empty event, another base attack, and then the crystal outburst will happen. Soon after this, the cycle will just rinse and repeat. Now I'll be demonstrating how to skip the specials. As you can see, this is a base attack and then the lightning stun. We'll get a base attack, an empty event, and then a base attack. After that will be the special. As you can see, it should have been the portal swap, but because we turned the head at a certain time, we didn't get that. We got a base attack, an empty event, a base attack, and now the healing hand. Now to skip the next special. Base attack, empty event, base attack, and then the crystal outburst. But as you can see, we just skip the crystal outburst. Base attack, empty event, base attack, lightning stun. But we just skip the lightning stun once again because we had made the head turn. Base attack, empty event, base attack, and then the portal swap. Now. There is very common confusion when it comes to getting two base attacks from the Great Ohm back to back, and people are wondering what they're doing wrong. However, nothing is being done wrong. This basically means the Great Ohm is trying to catch up with itself with where it's at in the cycle, and it basically double attacks and moves the attack onto the next event. As you can see, everything on this list is an event, the special, the base attack, and the empty event. So it'll try to double hit and move the event to the next event. So for example, if we skip the base attack and go to the lightning stun, the base attack and the lightning stun will happen at the same time and it'll go right into a base attack right after. So let's see where we are in the cycle. We just got the healing hand effect. We have a base attack, a base attack. Now we should have the crystal swap. After this, a base attack, an empty event, and a base attack. But let's skip that. The base attack will be delayed to the next event, which is the lightning stun, and double hit me as you can see here. Now, let's see what it looks like when we skip a special and continue the cycle while skipping the three events. We have the lightning stun. Now we have a base attack, an empty event, a base attack, and then the portal swap. We skip the portal swap. We've skipped the base attack here. Skip the empty event here. Skip the base attack here. And now it should be the healing hand. Now, moving on to the 4 to 1 cycle. The 4 to 1 cycle is much more difficult to set up than the 3 to 1 cycle and takes a bit of practice and timing as you're skipping special attacks. Because you're skipping special attacks compared to the 3 to 1 method, you are taking much less damage and things are a lot less hectic. The 4 to 1 method is the most common melee method when doing solo raids. Now, I'll be demonstrating what it looks like to set up the 4 to 1 cycle, continuing the cycle, and breaking down what it is exactly I'm doing differently and how to consistently set it up yourself.
as you can see, I am currently in the 4 to 1 cycle. I can hit the Ohm's melee hand 4 times and only take 1 hit from it. The first method in setting up the 4 to 1 cycle is the method that I most commonly use and is the method that I think is the easiest to learn. You can follow along on the left side of the screen and see what's going on. Every single time I'm making the head turn, that is an event happening. So let's figure out where we are in the cycle. Special attack, base attack, base attack, empty event. We can skip this base attack. That's a special because it turned. Now we have a base attack an empty event, and we're skipping the uh, base attack here, skipping the special there, base attack, empty event, skipping base attack, skipping special. And that's basically the gist of setting up the 4 to 1 cycle, and visually explained on the left side of the screen. It doesn't matter which special it is, so long as we're skipping a special right there. Now. I completely get when people say they don't want to read that huge mumbo jumbo on the left hand side of the screen. I understand it's a bit overwhelming. When I first started doing solo raids, I had no idea what that meant and I just kind of knew when to do things. So in order to set up the 4 to 1 cycle as simple as I can, I'll tell you this. The moment you see a base attack and an empty event, get ready to skip the next base attack. Then you're easily into the 4 to 1 cycle. As you can see there, it was a base attack, empty event. Now I'm skipping the base attack and the special right here. And now you're just in the 4 to 1 cycle. Base attack, empty event. After the empty event, run the head, and you're in the 4 to 1 cycle. Base attack, empty event, and skipping the next base attack. Another method in setting up the 4 to 1 cycle in a simple manner is waiting for two base attacks to happen in quick succession and dealing with it from there. We have one base attack, followed by another base attack. Now we just quickly three to one into the cycle. And now the four to one cycle is set. Another lazy method in setting the 4 to 1 cycle is waiting for the lightning. You can see that there's lightning, and now that'll be a base attack and an empty event right here. Now you want to run the head as if you were going to skip that base attack and skip this special right here. And now the 4 to 1 is set. Another simple method in setting up the 4 to 1 cycle is determining when a special is going to happen and making the head turn right the moment the special happens so we can skip that special. When you continue the 4 to 1 cycle from that point on, you're kind of starting in the middle of the cycle. So let's determine where we are. We have a portal swap, base attack, we should have an empty event, a base attack, now it should be the special. Because we skipped it right there, we should be in the 4 to 1 cycle now. Just like so. It's a pretty simple way, but you're just going to have to predict when a special is going to come. Base attack, empty event, and skipping the base attack. And skipping the special when it turns right there. The pathing for the 4 to 1 cycle is really important in learning how to do it. The pathing that I do basically anticipates the flame wall by running over here but also anticipates the acid walk. Now, I'll demonstrate what it looks like to 4 to 1 with the acid walk in the next clip.
Damaging the melee hand in a 4 to 1 cycle while acid walking is kind of complex and can seem pretty daunting at first. However, with some practice, it is definitely worth the learn. Now, I'll demonstrate what it looks like to dodge the flame wall with the exact same pathing. A common mistake when doing 4 to 0 is thinking that because the head turns to the center because you hit a 0, you're doing it incorrectly. So this is what it looks like if you hit a 0. Now sometimes when you hit a 0, the head will move to the middle. Just like so. Now you decide to continue the cycle as normal. As long as you skip the special right there, you'll be fine. So let's say I hit a 0 right here and the head turns to the middle. Just go along as normal. Completely ignore it and you'll stay into the 4 to 1 cycle. Now that we've gone over the 4 to 1 cycle and the different methods on how to set it up, we must go over what is a scuffed ohm. Now, a scuffed ohm seems like a weird term, but in actuality it does exist. Knowing what a scuffed ohm is isn't the most important thing in the world, but it does change some mechanics when doing the 4 to 1 cycle. Thanks to our friend Lake, he actually reached out to me and decided that, you know, we should add what a scuffed ohm is. So I'll be kind of reading off his explanation of what it is. Scuffed ohm affects some timing on different things. The falling crystals uh, during the crystal phase, uh, crystals between the phases, the area of effect. Um, the flame walls are all a tick later and the bombs are a bit weird as well. Basically, everything is delayed by a tick. Now, in order to avoid this, you just kind of have to work around it. No one knows what causes a scuffed ohm, so you're just going to have to recognize it and try to figure out a way on how to figure out a different 4 to 1 path, which I'll be showing you momentarily. As you just saw, the non-scuffed ohm flame wall, you know, dissipates as normal and you can continue the 4 to 1 cycle as normal. But now I'll show you what it looks like during a scuffed ohm. As you can see, I didn't change anything about my 4 to 1 pathing. However, the flame wall didn't dissipate in time for me to go to the right and make the head turn to continue the cycle. As I said, Scuffed Ohm makes everything one tick later, so because of this, I couldn't physically get past the flame wall. The pathing for the Scuffed Ohm 4 to 1 cycle is a bit different from the original pathing, however not too different. Instead of staying at the ring finger, we go one tile further and go to the pinky tile. This is so that we have time for the flame wall to dissipate on this side of the Great Ohm. However, if you're on the other side of the Great Ohm, then the flame wall doesn't spawn at all. As you can see there, you have time to anticipate it, have the flame wall disappear, and get right back into the cycle. Standing on this tile means you're also ready for the acid path, which I'll show you guys in the next clip.
as you just saw, the path thing for Acid in a scuffed Ohm 4 to 1 path is kind of messy, but you just kind of have to make do with what you have. Um, the next clip will show you guys what the flame wall would look like when you're doing the scuffed Ohm path in the 4 to 1 cycle. At this point, some of you are probably wondering which path to do. Now, I'm going to put this as easily as I can put it. Scuffed Ohm isn't that important to understand. So the non-scuffed path, which is the first 4 to 1 cycle that I've been showing you guys, is probably the best method. Um, so just don't get confused if, you know, the flame wall doesn't dissipate in time. I guess you just have to reset up the 4 to 1, but it's not the end of the world, is what I'm trying to say. Simply put... Scuffed Ulm is completely optional to even know about, and the knowledge of it comes with people that just are really hardcore solar raiders. Now we're finally ready to go over the Scythe 3 to 1 method. The Scythe 3 to 1 method is only for those who have learned the 4 to 1 method and are pretty thorough with it. Uh, it's a bit more complex than the 4 to 1 method, but it's the general same concept. The tile markers here are used for both the flame wall and anticipating on the right side so it doesn't spawn. And it's also for anticipating acid path as well. Now, I'll be showing you two ways of doing the scythe 4 to 1 method. And uh, I prefer the second way. To set up the 3 to 1 cycle, you have to be in the 4 to 1 cycle. So you can set it up whichever way you want with a 4 to weapon like the Grazi Rapier or any 4 to weapon or whichever way you want. So first we figure out where we are on the cycle. Base attack, empty event. Now I just quickly get into the cycle. And now I'm in it with the scythe. Now the first way is kind of annoying. You have to run the head at kind of like your own timing and it's kind of difficult as you can see. So one hit, two hit, and time it weirdly to get the third hit and run the head. How I personally like to do it is follow this path. Now, once after your second hit, you can walk each tile and make it just in time, as long as you time it right. And that's personally how I like to do it. Now I'll be explaining how this path fits into it all. As I said before, the second method is my favorite, where you click each tile individually and run the head in time. Now, this anticipates the flame wall, this anticipates the acid path, and this is just running back but also anticipating the acid path as well. Regardless of phase, I like to do this path so that over time it just becomes muscle memory as it works with pretty much any phase. So this is what the path would look like uh, when nothing's going on. No flame, no acid, nothing. Let's quickly get into the 4 to 1 cycle. And now we are. It's a pretty simple path. It's the path that I came up with on my own. And I personally love it more than anything. It's very comfortable to use, very easy to memorize, and uh, it works for everything. The Scythe Acid Path is a bit more complex to learn, but uh, with some practice and just constantly following the path, it just becomes second nature over time.
Now we're finally ready to explain the 4 to 0 method, also known as the 4 to none method. The 4 to 0 method is extremely complex and uh, I wouldn't recommend trying it unless you've completely mastered 4 to 1, uh, 3 to 1, and the mage hand running. Now, as I said before, there's three different kind of mage runnings, standing on that tile, the standard tile, and the tile before. So you need to learn all three methods in order to do this. Uh, it is very click intensive. I would only recommend it if you're low on food, but it is a method that is 100% worth learning over the long run. There are two different methods for doing the 4 to 0 method. And for both, you don't want to be in the long range tile when you're in the cycle. It's easy to do this with a four way switch, but I'll be demonstrating with five. First, you want to start the cycle by maging the mage hand, turning the head, switching to your melee gear, and hitting this hand three times. After that, switch back to your mage gear, clicking one tile further, and repeating the cycle. Now, it can be extremely tedious at times, and sometimes you'll splash just like so, but you can still continue the cycle. I personally don't like doing it this way, so what I like to do is. I click on the minimap, and personally, it helps out a lot, and I'll demonstrate that in just a moment. Instead of clicking that tile, I can click on the minimap, and switch into my mage gear, and let the dragging do the work for me. The next method is a bit more click intensive and I'm not a big fan of it. However, it does save you some run energy and for those hardcore raiders out there that want to test themselves, go for it. Instead of being one tile further away, you actually want to be one tile closer, which means you're adding in an extra click into the cycle. And uh, I personally don't like it, but for those that want to challenge themselves, uh, go for it. I have to demonstrate what it looks like going on the long range tile. As I said before, being a tile ahead or being a tile closer helps you catch up with yourself in the 4 to 0 cycle. However, if you try to do it on the long range tile, you won't make it in time because you're a tick off of the normal mage cycle, just like so. As you can see, you're already late and uh, the head is already turned, which means you'll never make it in time unless you're a tile ahead or a tile away. This next method is a bit weird and not the greatest DPS compared to running the mage hand traditionally and doing the site 3 to 1 method. However, I thought I would add this in just for the sake of the guide. It's a method that I personally came up with, but as I said before, it's uh, not that great and a bit more complex and click intensive. 
This essentially consists of constantly switching in between your gear and in between hands so that you never take any damage from the Great Ulm. Uh, it's a mixture between all the methods that I've discussed today, so it might be uh, a little more difficult to get used to. On the final phase of Ulm, you have to be very careful not to do too much damage to one hand over the other, as you're supposed to kill them at around the same time. If you do too much damage to one hand over the other, you'll end up killing it. And after you kill it, an HP bar will come up. Once it reaches full, that means you've failed, and you have to kill the hand all over again. Once you're ready to kill both hands, it's recommended to kill the melee hand first. This is because if you kill the mage hand first but the melee hand decides to heal at the wrong time, you're kind of screwed and you're going to have to start from scratch. Once you've killed both hands, you're ready to kill the final phase by switching into your range gear. Once you've completed the final phase, the head phase will start. But the head phase can no longer do cycles. However, the head can do phase specific attacks, acid, flame, and crystals. It can do all of the phase specifics. On top of that, there are now fallen crystals throughout the entire fight, and you must constantly move to make sure you're dodging all of them. As you can already see, the head can still turn depending on where you're standing, so you can still manipulate how much damage you're actually taking during this part of the fight. The only extra mechanic the head phase has is healing pools. He'll fire two pools of healing at you, and you need to stand on either one. However, if you don't stand on any, you'll take a bit of damage, and the Great Ohm will heal just a bit. Now, there's a certain timing so that you don't take too much damage when the pools are out, and so you don't take too much damage when the crystals falling. The moment you see the pools, you want to stand on top of them, and the second you see a purple hit splat, you can immediately walk off. So now we just wait a bit, do some damage or whatever, purple splat, and we can immediately head off. Even though you can see that there's uh, the pool that's still there, you can immediately move off the second you see the purple hit splat. It's a lot of misconception that, you know, hey, I don't want to move off, the pool is still there, but... It's a matter of the Ulm has already, you know, determined that it's not going to heal uh, the moment it's gone to purple hit spot. When starting the head phase, you have to understand which weapon is your best choice. If you brought yourself a rune crossbow slash armored crossbow with a blowpipe, the blowpipe is your best method. However, if you brought a dragon hunter crossbow, the dragon hunter crossbow is best in slot for the entire Ulm's head. Now, this is where it depends on your bolts. If you run Ruby Bolt, it's best up until about 10% left, which is when you want to switch into your bolt pipe. However, if you brought Diamond Bolts, a, the Dragon on a Crossbow is best the entire head phase. And of course, the Tebow is superior to every single method. The first ranged method is the Blowpipe method. Now, because you're using the Blowpipe and moving every two tiles, you're a bit more versatile, so you'll be taking a little less damage from all the crystals. It's similar to Shaman's in that the moment the head turns, you want to move and attack at the same exact tick. A tip I want to say is, you want to start on either safe spot, whether it be the left safe spot or the right safe spot. Simply because, uh, because you're moving every two tiles, you'll actually make your way to the other safe spot. The second it turned, move and attack the bullpipe at the same time. And constantly make your way to the other safe spot just in time for the head to turn. And you can just rinse and repeat all the way until the head phase is over. Just in time for the head to turn. And you've made your way to the other side. Before I demonstrate the next methods, I need to make it very clear that the T-Bow and any other crossbow on Rapid are the same exact ticks and timing. So whichever method that I'm doing, it doesn't matter if I'm using the T-Bow or the crossbow, it's the same exact concept. This next method is only really when you're low on food and need to save yourself supplies, as the DPS on this method isn't as good as the next method I'll be showing you guys. Now, if you want to do this method so that you can practice and not take so much damage, and of course maybe practice on your timings, I would highly suggest it. 
the gist of it is basically blow piping and then switching into your tebow or crossbow on the safe spot and then repeating the cycle blow pipe once switch into your tebow crossbow and run back as i said before the timing for the tebow and crossbow are the same so it doesn't matter which weapon you're using blow pipe once tebow or crossbow and repeat the cycle This next method is the best method in terms of DPS with the Tebow or the Dragon Hunter crossbow. You take a little bit of damage, but it's worth it in terms of speeding up the entirety of your fight. The timing is similar as to Blowpipe into Tebow or Bow, but it's not all the same. And you have to make very good use of your safe spots. This method basically consists of constantly attacking when you're ready to attack, and maximizing input while minimizing the damage you get from the Great Ohm. When doing the last method, it's good to make use of the entire ohm room. Instead of sticking to one line, like for example, sticking right next to the ohm's head, you can move between lines diagonally. This is so that you never take damage from these uh, crystals if you time it properly. Moving diagonally means that the crystals will sometimes spawn on top of you, and you can constantly move and avoid them. Upon raid completion, you'll either get the standard loot or a special loot. If you get a special unique loot, it'll notify you in the chat by a special broadcast through your clan chat. As you can see, I'm probably not going to get anything as I spent 2 hours in this raid just getting clips for this guide. Now, if you guys want to surprise yourself in a different manner, once you complete the raid, if you get a white light, that means you didn't get a single unique item. However, if you get a purple light, I actually just got this live while recording the last clip for the solo raids guide. So uh, that's pretty cool. Now don't go anywhere just yet. I have a few things you might all want to hear. If you feel like you have a very specific question or questions that are unanswered in this video, please don't be afraid to reach out to me. My Twitter, official Discord, and Twitch will be down in the description. Uh, and I will get back to all of you when I can. If I don't reply immediately, it's because I haven't seen it yet. I will normally reply to each and every one of you guys, whether it's on Twitter or Discord. If it's on Twitch and I don't see your message, say I'm doing solo theater blood or really click and sets of bossing, don't be afraid to retype your message if I didn't see it. I made this guide to help people out and I'm not afraid to help anybody out. I know what it's like to feel ignored and being afraid to ask someone a question that you feel is annoying or pestering, but don't worry about that. With me, just feel comfortable to reach out to me and ask whatever questions you might have. Uh, down below will also be a link to Wooks' solo raids guide if you find this difficult, hard to understand. Stay West's 4 to 1 guide if you guys are having troubles understanding my interpretation of it. As well as Thoboy's raids team guide if you want to learn team raids before solo raids. Now, this guide took me over 100 hours to make, literally. I think I've been sitting at raids for over 100 hours and I think I've completed maybe 15 of them. And out of 15 of them, maybe 10 of them had like 20 points in it. Um, so I've spent a lot of time on this guide. I've been six houred at Ohm so many times and all of the clips are done live for the sake of understanding everything as it's happening. So, you know, it, it makes it easier to understand that I know what I'm talking about and I can easily answer your questions when I'm doing this live myself, which is why everything is done live. Down below in the description will be three different kind of raids. I have done a weapons only solo raid, which means absolutely no potions except for stamina and antidotes. No overloads, no enhances, no food, no brews, no restores, just weapons and that. 
um also a low tier gear raid as an example uh completely in like mystics and rune if you guys want to see that as well and challenge mode challenge mode is done in max gear but i explain everything live so once you finish watching this solo raids guide you can feel free to watch the challenge mode raids guide and see if you want to do challenge mode solos as well as i explain everything there live alongside that i have linked a lot of my fellow streamers and friends now all of these streamers are either really good friends of mine have supported the streams uh, are raid streamers and teach people or are solo raiders um so if you feel like you're not down there if you are a friend of mine if i follow you if i talk to you you're probably down there and if i did miss you and i do talk to you i will probably add you just make sure to shoot me a dm and let me know now besides all that uh quick shout out to all the people that contributed as i was doing it uh wooks for letting me use the image and always being an incredible role model to me he's an extremely nice person it's actually unreal he's really genuine amazing pvmer i would highly recommend checking him out in the description as well shout out to rice cup who actually helped me with the rendering issues he has supported me throughout this entire solo raids guide and i love him to death amazing guy amazing pvmer great solo raider please check him out and of course our good friend lake he has contributed a lot to this guide, helping me out with Scuffed Ulm, uh, giving me his opinions on certain clips, if it's explained well and everything. Uh, so I would highly recommend checking him out. Incredible PVMer, he does do a lot of solo raids. I'm sure all of you guys watching this know that. He's a little dry for the Twisted Bow, like Kodai, so he will be streaming a lot of solo raids. Now, I would consider him even better than me, so if I fail to answer a question for whatever reason, please make sure to check out his Twitter, his Twitch, everything. He's an incredible guy, and I would highly recommend checking him out. Also, shouting out my friend Jagex Aiza. He is an incredible Jagex moderator. He shows an incredible amount of support for me and so many other content creators. Um, he's so in touch with the community and passionate about what he does and i can't thank him enough he actually hooked me up with an oculus orb which i actually used in the making of this video so i would highly recommend checking him out as well he does stream runescape and by runescape i mean rune crafting so uh you know he's very talkative he's very nice welcoming so if you guys want to go check him out i know he doesn't stream solo raids but you know he's honestly an amazing guy just to be around and just watch his streams even if he's not doing solo raids or whatever so shout out to him as well extremely sincere and passionate guy i love him to death and thank you so much man also shout out to my man zulu for the incredible sweater really comfortable really nice uh, i absolutely love it uh he's also a really good friend of mine he'll also be linked down in the description as well um but other than that thank you guys all so much for watching i have put so many hours into this so if you guys did enjoy the video please make sure to like maybe link it to your friends i feel like i went over everything that i possibly could so thank you guys all for watching and hopefully i'll catch you all in the next video take care everyone